Hello and good afternoon. Thank you all for joining the Plan Mecca Digital Mastery Series. My name is Jody Rodney. I'm the Vice President of Marketing and Education for Plan Mecca USA. With us today is Brent Garvin, and his topic is 3D Imaging Software Navigating in a 3D Space. Before we get started, I do have a few things I wanted to touch base on. One, all attendees are muted and you're not on your camera, so enjoy your PJs and coffee. Um, if you have questions for Brent, please submit them via the Q&A feature um, that's located at the bottom of the Zoom window. Uh, we will try and stop periodically throughout the presentation to answer some questions, but we will also have a dedicated um, time at the end of the presentation for additional questions. If you're having any issues um, with sound or audio, um, visual issues, please submit those via the chat and we'll try and troubleshoot uh, behind the scenes. Uh, we anticipate that Brent's presentation will last approximately one hour. Um, and at the end of the presentation, we will share the CE survey, um, which we will also share in a post webinar email um, that will be sent tomorrow along with the webinar recording. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Brent Garvin. Brent, take it away. Thank you, Jody, and thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon. Um, know that you have a lot of choices out there for webinar and education content at this time, so we appreciate you uh, spending the next hour with us. So let me kind of just walk through the agenda of what we're going to do for the next hour um, and so that you have a basic understanding of where we're going to go today. So I want to share with you some tips and tricks on basic use of 3D imaging software. So if you have uh, received a disc from another dentist that has a 3D machine and they've sent you a 3D image. Um, hopefully we can give you some tips and tricks on how to, getting, get, how to get through the software and navigate through it and some of the common features and functions that are amongst all of the 3D imaging softwares that are out there so that you're just comfortable with it. Um, I'll go through several cases so we'll have um, time to go through some implant cases, some endos, uh, we'll look at some fractures, things like that. I'll give you some tips and tricks in that area as well. Uh, maybe get in some ortho images. And then when we're all done, if we have time, we're going to wrap it all up and kind of just start over from the beginning and just review everything in a systematic approach on how you can go through a protocol yourself, uh, regardless of whatever 3D imaging software that you are utilizing. Um, and at the end, as Jody mentioned, uh, will be Q&A. So we will finish the, um, the hour with uh, questions and answers. However, uh, however, if you do have questions during the, um, the lecture, feel free to, to chime in under the Q&A section and ask a question and, and Jody will kindly um, let me know and we can address them as we go along. And at the very end, uh, CE will be provided. So full disclosure, I am an employee of Plan Mecca, Senior Product Manager for Imaging for Plan Mecca USA. And I wanna let you know that these uh, educational seminars we provide are for CEs. They are education and content, uh, not product driven. And I just wanna draw your attention to other courses that are coming up um, this week um, on Friday. We have a fantastic kickoff of our sleep medicine courses, uh, three part uh, series that will follow this introductory uh, course on Friday, May 8th. So if you visit our website at planmecca.com or if you see the hyperlink there, um, you can uh, get directly to those webinars. But if you go to the Plan Mecca website, you'll see that right on the front page uh, that'll allow you to get access to all of our courses. Um, we're going to have on Friday as well, a hygienist talking about um, uh, new safety protocols in the dental office. So hopefully you can join her as well. And then Dr. Tony Manito on May 12th, we'll go over onlays and inlays. And on the uh, 15th of May, we will then begin the uh, the series for sleep medicine um, so that you'll have one on the 22nd and then finish on the 29th as well. So hopefully you'll be able to join us. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, we don't have much time here, so I wanna give you as much valuable information to help you uh, with your 3D imaging software of choice. So first of all, I would probably recommend that if you are going to view images, find a semi-dark room. Lighting is very critical. Um, and as far as the monitor, uh, most radiologists would, would probably agree that uh, image monitor quality is important. Uh, medical grade monitors are not necessary um, for viewing images, but just get yourself a good quality monitor based upon the specifications of the imaging software that you're viewing with. Um, one of the recommendations I would say 
is look for glares on your screen. So I have lights uh, around me uh, today that are cast so they are not providing glare on my screen. So the best thing you could do is turn off your monitor, not right now, but when you're in front of a 3D image, feel free to turn off your monitor and look at the reflections in the monitor to make sure that you're not getting any ambient light um, that might be reflecting off from some other object in, the, in your operatory or your private room or wherever you're viewing 3D images. And then the last thing I would suggest that you do is if you download a test pattern for calibration, that's a fantastic way to determine whether your monitor is set up properly to view these images. So this is a sample test pattern. This is inside um, Planmeca's imaging software. And so you have the ability to look at these images and just quickly, um, you can see a white uh, box here and a light gray here. And then this mon uh, box here is black, but I can also see a little lighter shade uh, box in here as well. And then quality control is in these three boxes here. Now, I'm not asking you to make any adjustments to your monitor right now, but this is a fantastic way for you to look at um, and calibrate your monitor to make sure that you're getting the best that you can out of your 3D software. So let's go ahead and get started and let me um, move into our uh, 3D software. As I mentioned, the tips and tricks I'm going to share with you are um, you could use them across any 3D imaging software. Most 3D imaging softwares um, do basically the same um, principal things that are required for DICOM viewing. Um, but this software I'm going to use today is uh, the Romexa software by Planmeca because that's the software that we use. So um, your software may look different. You may receive a disk from another office and you may just have to auto run that viewing software. But once you get inside the image, um, this all should look very familiar to you. So I'm gonna go ahead and get started with some basic images here. Uh, this is a good image that I use for training. Um, if we're just learning to go through th 3D images, if you open up your 3D software and you view your image, typically they will tell you the size of the image. They will tell you the voxel size or the resolution. So this one is a 0.2 and that will be the indicator of KV and MA as well. So this image here was an eight by eight, so it's eight centimeters uh, deep and eight centimeters high. As far as your viewing software, all the softwares are basically uh, set up the same way. You have three planes of space in a 3D DICOM image. Your international color for coronal is green, and that is this box here. This is the green slice here. So if we look at this slice of the patient here from the side, this is the coronal view and then from the top or I'm sorry from the bottom this green line signifies this plane view as well. In the sagittal view it's in red so you'll notice around your screen is red that is this red slice here and this red slice here and then the last plane of space your plane view is your axial view uh, taken after medical they look at images from the bottom up if you're like me and you've looked at CAD designs and you're used to looking at things from the aerial view, you can flip flop those generally back and forth. Um, so you can see here, um, typically by default, you're looking at the patient from the bottom up. And then in your bottom right hand corner is your rendering. Depending on the software that you use, you have different rendering styles that you can choose from typically. So this is our rendering software um, that's generated here in the bottom right. So as far as mouse controls, um, let me kind of just show you some of the things that um, will help you get through scans if you're new to 3D software. For starters, some softwares allow you to left click and pan the image. And then a right click typically does a rotation of the image. Scroll wheels allow you to zoom. Now, if your software by default is not set up that way, not a big deal. In our software here, I can do a couple of things. I can turn this icon off. I can turn this icon off. If I do that, now watch as my plane views move and the actual 3D image stays still. So now I can travel over to a particular tooth. I can right click and rotate and set that up any way I want. And then I can use my scroll wheel to scroll through the different layers of the 3D image. 
So hopefully that was clear and um, kind of gives you a good starting point of how you look at an image. If you um, ever take courses from a, a board certified radiologist, one of the things they will share with you is you basically want to look at symmetry so you can go through your scans and get everything lined up so everything is symmetrical so that you can compare left sides from right sides and you can understand oh, what they would call normal versus abnormal. So basically having your image set up in a balanced sort of format is the best thing that you can do. So as far as getting your software prepared to view images, once again, every imaging software is slightly different. The first thing you'll notice that when you open up a 3D image, it may not default to the slice thickness that the image was taken. So I mentioned earlier that a 0.2 millimeter slice, so that was a 200 voxel image taken on this particular 3D machine. The slice thickness came in at a 0.6. If I hit the pull down, I can choose any slice thickness that I desire. And usually the highest resolution that the image was taken is going to be at the top. So if I choose 0.2, I'm now looking at the thinnest slice that that 200 voxel size machine produced for me. So I go ahead and change that if I desire. If I thicken the slice, I'll get more blurry of an image and fill out voids, but I typically take it to the thinnest slice possible. Second thing I do in every image is I control my contrast and brightness. So you have a slide bar typically in your software that will allow you to adjust your contrast, your brightness, and your sharpen factors. Now by default, I can certainly customize that and record that, so I never have to go back and change those sort of things, but please understand that when you're using a, any 3D software, each patient is gonna be affected differently by the amount of radiation. So you may have to adjust your contrast and brightness depending on your monitor. So if I could give you one tip and trick or a couple tips and tricks on contrast, brightness, and sharpen, I would probably suggest that typically you see images more on the high contrast side. They usually come in a little bit blurrier. So typically this is what a 3D image would look like natively taken from a 3D machine. Now there's nothing wrong with high contrast. Maybe we're looking at carries and we want to see um, those sort of things. We're looking for MB2s and we want to be able to see those sort of details in contrast does have its benefit. However, if I take my contrast down and give a little bit more gray images, gray scales towards those images, and then I use my brightness factor based upon my monitor and then take my sharpen factor up, I can produce an image that I would say is probably very acceptable to any board certified radiologist. So what they're looking for is, is look at the airway here. You'll notice that if I take my contrast down, I start to fill it, the more I bring it up, I'm going to whitewash it out. So I wanna get a delicate balance based upon my monitor. I don't know how it looks on your end, but through my uh, MacBook here, this looks pretty good for my contrast. And then the last thing that I would point attention to you is your rendering. So in the bottom right hand corner is our rendering of the image. Now this is our um, x-ray shaded style default image that is found in our software. The software that you're using may look slightly different. That's not a problem with Plan Mecca. If I hit my little wrench here, I can customize it and change it to be any rendering style that I want. In fact, this is typically the rendering style that you might be used to looking at. This is your MIP view. This is an image projection um, uh, uh, rendering that is known throughout DICAM, DICOM imaging and is typically found on most 3D imaging softwares. And I'll tell you the secret of why. When you look at an image, let's go back to what I would call a traditional image that looks more like a rendering of a patient's skull. You'll notice on the side of the teeth here is what's called scatter radiation. And if I take this and I exaggerate this, I can attempt to put that scatter radiation back on the image. Now, this is not a diagnostic part of the image. This is for patient presentation. However, I might want it to look a little bit better. So I need to adjust my threshold on my rendering. So hopefully your 3D software has that capability to make those minor adjustments 
and dial this in exactly how you like it. What you'll notice is, is if I add back the scatter radiation and I switch to the MIP view, view that the industry prefers to use, they do that because it's a great way to hide that scatter radiation. So now you notice that there is no scatter radiation coming off those teeth, but it's a transparent image. Downside to that is you don't have good topography. Once again, this is not for diagnostic purposes. There's the mental frame and you can see right here if I maximize it for you. But as far as topography, I lose that when I look at an image that's in MIP. So this is an old style way of looking at images, uh, rendering images. Certainly not um, what you would want to, to look at um, from a, uh, assisting you with diagnostics, um, but it does help you with, with scatter radiation. So um, let me just go back to X-ray shaded if you don't mind. So once again, we've kind of showed you the chronal view, sagittal view, axial view. If you're new to 3D software, many would describe the chronal view as looking at the patient from the PA view, not periapical, but posterior to anterior or anterior to posterior. So I'm looking at my patient straight on. Some would call that a cross-sectional view, and I'm looking right down the patient's um, jaw. And you can see the mental foramen um, right here on the patient's uh, lower right of their mandible. The sagittal view, I would describe that. Some would describe that as, well, let's go ahead and look at it, as your PA view. So if I had an image like this, that might look very familiar to you, and that's could be described as a periapical type of view or a bite wing sort of a view of, of the patient. So if you're comfortable looking at PAs, you should be comfortable looking what you're seeing here as we go through what I call a dynamic PA. So I can control that periapical at any point and stop and get a nice view as I need to. And then the axial view, if you're an orthodontist, you've looked at an SMV, you'll know what I'm referring to. This is looking at the patient from the bottom up. So an SMV staff is very uh, similar to what the axial view is. So once again, if you've never looked at 3D software and had a chance to uh, play with it, there's no reason to be intimidated by looking at the patient in 360 degree views now. Hey Brent, can I pause and um, Absolutely. ask a question? Yep. Um, we have a question about um, the clarity of the rendering that you're showing being much more clear than what one of our Bromexis uh, customers is seeing. Is there anything that they can do to improve the clarity? So your adjustments can be controlled right here. You got contrast, brightness, and threshold. Your wrench here is your default views, so you can record anything you want. So let's say you set up this image exactly how you want. If you hit add, we can record that. We can call that Brent's image. And now it's recorded. If I right click copy, or I'm sorry, right click, I can set it as a default and I never have to change that ever again. Flexibility is there for you to set it up any way you want. If you're looking for tips and tricks on scatter radiation, don't be alarmed. Scatteration happens. Are there things you can do? Absolutely. So um, obviously uh, radiologists and, and labs have talked about the puffer technique where a patient puffs up their cheeks. Uh, you can put cotton rolls in the vestibule to get the um, soft tissue away from uh, the crown of the tooth and that will help with scatter radiation. Once you get down in the bone level, scatter radiation is not happening at that point. But when you're at the crown level, that's typically where you see that sort of scatter. Great. So, and while, while you're on that same page, um, at somebody is asking if you can demonstrate how to change the direction of the green and red lines on your screen. So it depends on how you're comfortable or how you've used software in the past. As I mentioned before, if I click these off, so I've turned toggled zoom off and on, and I've turned my rotate volume on or off, by default, we move the plane view or I'm sorry, the volume, the plain views hold still. So if I wanna move the green line, I can grab the slide bar and move that and control the green. If I wanna control red, I have to go to my sagittal view here and control red from my sagittal view. Now, once again, that's the default view. Some of us have preferences of how we like images and how the mouse controls uh, need to be controlled. 
So if I turn those off, I now have changed this to work as my scroll wheel scrolls. And if I want to move my green over here, I'm just left clicking. I'm taking it to the tooth I want. And then I right click and I'm rotating around that tooth. Now I've got a 360 degree view of that entire tooth. So hopefully that answered that question. If I hit reset orientation, I get myself back to the way I was. So, um, all right, so let's go ahead and um, look at some of the, the features of the software and things that um, you would probably have in your software. Um, if it was not Romexis, typically you have measuring tools. So if I hit measure here and I left click and I drag down, I can get a measurement. Obviously that's one-to-one. -one. We've got uh, 21.25. You notice it recorded it over here under the object browser. So if I ever want to delete that, I can just check box it, throw it in a trash can and say goodbye to it. The measure tool also can be used rather than left click and dragging. If your 2D software that you're using for your sensors is different and you want to click to start your measurement and click again to end your measurement, the software does that as well. It's however you prefer to have the software set up. That's the nice thing about it. So you can just control how that mouse works for you. And if you like it one way, you can set it up that way. If you like it another way, you can do it that way as well. So um, annotations are all here and we'll kind of go through that as we get through scans. Uh, a couple other things I wanna quickly point out while I have this up and then we'll get into some uh, cases that we can uh, roll up our sleeves and um, look at um, some images directly. So get some power here so we don't lose power to the computer. All right, so across the top here, um, just a couple things. Let's say you're going through a scan and I'll go through and show you my systematic approach um, as we get into the software here and look at images. But let's say you're going through a scan and you see some pathology. Now what's really nice is, is if you wanted to um, send this off to a board certified radiologist, if you hit this button here, you can have a radiology report sent back to you quickly from a board certified radiologist. And this is built right inside the 3D software. Also here, you'll notice if we want to send off for a surgical guide, if we're not gonna 3D print that in our office with guide design software, um, that Romexis has, then you would certainly just hit uh, contact information and hit place order, and that would send off to a lab so that a uh, surgical guide could be manufactured for you. And then the last thing I wanna show you on this screen here is our cloud um, services. So if you wanted to uh, send this image off back to someone after we've looked at it, we can hit cloud services and we can send this image um, back to um, any uh, dentist that we're collaborating with. If it's a specialist, we can hit cloud services and that would send the image in a HIPAA compliant environment back to someone that we're collaborating with. They would receive the, an email with a HIPAA compliant code, a second email that allows them to view the image by entering that HIPAA compliant security code into the 3D image, and now they can view the image just like we are with full access to Romexis. Hey, the Brent, only thing, yep. I'm sorry to interrupt. We've got a quick question there just about, you said this button here um, to get the report, um, but somebody didn't see which one it was. Yeah, so order services is at the top here. If I ho hover over to it, it's saying order services, hopefully on your end, and if I click it, it looks like a 3D um, icon. If it's not on your software, if you're a current user of ours, you can go to uh, YouTube and, um, and uh, do a search for radiology reports with let's say Romexis or Plan Mecca or whatever company that you're using and they should have a way to set that up. So it's not by default set up, you just have to add that toolbar uh, or icon on your top toolbar. So if your software doesn't have it and you're using Romexis, it's not there because you have to activate it. So um, and once again, those videos are found on uh, YouTube. All right, so let's get back to, um, I went and hit a cloud services um, when I wasn't set up to the internet by accident. So I'm going to certainly want to close here for a second and then restart Romexis if you don't mind, only because I 
um, hit that when I was not supposed to, when I was not hooked up to the internet. So just give me a second here and I'll restart Romexis. As we're doing that, um, if there's any other questions, Jody, um, you can go ahead and send those my way. Um, one person says that their screen resolution um, is uh, 3K x 2K and they have their magnification turned on to 200% and they still have issues reading the icons in the menu in Romexis. Don't know if there's a fix for this, but it is an issue. Um, so, so any sort of uh, technical um, specs and, require, and, and things like that are found on planmecca.com's website. If they have um, the specs and they have a monitor that meets it, then it'll work just fine. So best thing to do is just call tech support and they can probably navigate through and find out what their settings are or contact their local IT company to um, whoever they got their monitor from should be able to set that up. Great, we're through the questions right now. All right, wonderful. All right, so we're back here. Sorry about that. I got a little ahead of myself and hit that cloud export image and it was looking for my email, which I don't have set up um, on the computer right now to slow down resources. And so it yelled at me. So we just went ahead and shut that down. And then the last thing I wanted to show you before we continue on here is um, as you're going through a scan, and let's say you see some pathology or you see something, once again, you don't have to know what it is, but let's say that you wanted to make a notation of something here. We have the disk here called save view. If you hit save view, we could say, well, we have a lesion of endodontic origin on tooth number, let's say 12 or what have you. And you can say okay to that. And then it's recorded here. What's nice about that is as you go through a scan and let's say you um, get interrupted and you're called in to see a patient, and then you come back, if you hit this bookmark, it'll take you back in time to where that image is um, and where you save that bookmark. So hopefully that uh, help you. For those that are looking at a monitor and it's a little smaller, it was this icon right here called Save View. All right, so let's go ahead um, and let's get into some images if you don't mind. Um, I'm gonna start out with, um, an image that uh, most are, are looking at. Um, typically, let's see here, if we're looking for taking a 3D image and we're looking for a MB2, a missed canal, short fill, fractures, things like that, um, this is um, a fantastic image to kind of show you um, how I would suggest you go through an image. So for starters, this is my image. Um, I think at the top here, I'm having a hard time seeing uh, my display here. Let me see if I can change this. And I can see that this image is a 75 micron scan. So this is our endo mode and we took it at 75 microns, so 0 0.075. So as you can see here in the axial view, this is my sinus here that is full. You can see um, this here as well, doesn't belong. And then as far as your slice thickness, once again, they usually come in thicker than the native slice. So if I want, I can change that to the 0 0.075 and look at that image in the, the thinnest slice possible, or I can thicken the slice. And now you'll notice that it's a little bit smoother. So if you don't mind, I'm gonna go back to the thinnest slice and I'm gonna tell you exactly why and when you would ever want to adjust that to your advantage. So let's go through the scan. I'm gonna turn this icon off, which is my toggle zoom. I'm gonna turn this move rotate off because this is how I like to use the software. And I'm gonna start at this tooth here and I'm gonna start going down, traveling down. If this helps you, let me turn on the plane view here and you can see exactly where I'm at. So as I'm scrolling up and down, this is where I'm at on this particular anatomy here. So I'm in the, um, uh, near the root tip of, of that tooth. You can see my blue line here as well. And if it helps you, I can maximize so that we can see this together a little bit more clearly. And if I go ahead and scroll through the image and let's just take us down, this patient obviously has some symptoms on tooth number 14, I believe. And if we continue to travel through this tooth here, we can certainly see that we have an MB2. So you can see here, there's one canal, two canal, three canal, four. 
So let's say we saw that and we wanted to make an annotation. Once again, we can hit save view and we can say MB2. Oh, I think that's tooth number 14. And we can say okay. And as I travel through this scan here, let's travel down. Once I get over here, I can see that. As I travel up through the tooth, and I get up to here, I can now see a fracture. So there's a nice sizable fracture. In fact, you can see here that uh, the tooth is chipped off slightly there as well. So this is a fantastic scan that's given us two things in one. It's given us a fantastic view of an MB2 as well as a fracture as I get up into the crown level here. So you can see that fracture. And can you show which, um, how did you get to that view? So I have this set up like this and I just took my cursor over here, centered it over that tooth and then I right clicked and rotated. In fact, if I look over here, I can see that fracture right here as well. And I can continue to scroll through. I can see the fracture going through the tooth here. And let's go back to the roots. There's my MB2. I promised you I was going to show you why you would want to thicken the slice or thin the slice. So let's go ahead and maximize. And you can see your MB2 clearly. That looks fantastic. That's really not of any concern. But if we look at an image in its highest resolution, the thinnest slice possible, you'll notice that the image can be grainy, can be noisy. And maybe this is too much detail and it's hard to see those missing canals. So if I take the slice thickness up to let's say six, I begin to smoothen out the image. And some endodontists, what they'll do is, is they'll take the image and thicken it up even further. So the thicker I create that image, maybe I can pull that information out. So don't think that when you look at an image, what you see is what you get and you're all done. You have these tools available to you so that you can take advantage of your views. So if you can maybe not see something and you suspect it's there and you wanna pull that information out, use the tools that are in the software to help you find that. So- Brent, just to confirm yeah. that there's nothing that you need to do when taking the image. It, this can all be done afterwards, correct? Correct, yep. So if you're gonna look for a fracture, for example, you're probably gonna to wanna to take the image at the highest resolution the, Im the machine can produce. So for example, this is taken at a 0 0.075. So I have 75 voxel size. That's where I'm looking for a fracture. And that's probably about it. MB2s, regular pathology, abscesses, all can be seen at 200 microns normal resolution. The only time I would advise ever taking a high res scan is if you are attempting to possibly look at a fracture. So what happens is, is the endodontic community needs high res scans because they're typically either treating a tooth or retreating a tooth. So if they're going to be retreating, they may want to look and see if there was a missed canal, was there a short fill, or was there a fracture? Might be one of the three things they're looking for. So of course, they're gonna to wanna to take the highest res scan they can. Here's the problem. If you take a high res scan, you create noise. The best way I can describe this to you is everybody in dental school has heard about tomography and its relationship to bread. So if we take our loaf of wonder bread and we slice it up, that is tomography. That is CT imaging. Medical and dental are just two different ways of creating a book. So dental CT will come around and basically create the book and pull from that at slices and medical CT might do it in reverse. My point is, is if I take that image at the highest resolution and I take that slice of bread, I can create problems. What problems could happen? Well, think of it this way. If I took a slice and it's 0.2 millimeters thick and it's one slice of bread and I hold it up to the sunshine, I hold it up to the light, I may see the light coming through the bread and I may see how the bread is made. 
But if I take a thinner slice and I slice that bread really thin, like a 0 0.075, and I hold that up to the light, what am I going to see? I'm going to see more light coming through. So the image is going to be noisier. The sensor is being more sensitive to lighting. So if you've taken photography classes, you'll know what I'm referring to. So if I open up that shutter and I say, bring it on in, I'm going to cause either a good response or a bad response. So when I've taken a 75 micron scan, I'm opening up the sensor so it's more sensitive and I'm driving more radiation through the tube head, creating more photons to that sensor to get a better image quality. Downside is thinner slice might not be the best thing for your eye. So feel free to just select a thicker slice and that might give you the information that you were looking for. Maybe it won't, but that's the beauty of 3D imaging or any sort of digital type of image is you have that flexibility. In fact, if I have that image here, I can take a little photograph like this. I hit this little camera and now that image is sitting over my 2D world and I can right click copy it, right click paste and send that right back to uh, someone that doesn't have 3D software or 3D isn't used to looking at 3D images, I can take 2D snapshots of any of these teeth. And if I hit that little camera and I go to my 2D world, there's my images. Once again, I can right click copy and I can do a nice copy to clipboard and I can go to my email and do a right click paste. In fact, while we're here, this is our 2D imaging portion of the software. So you can cruise through your pans and your bite wings and all of that. These are my snapshots that I just took. There's photographs, intraoral camera images, and then of course, intraoral x-rays as well. Uh, getting back to the 3D here, let's go ahead. And now, um, if you don't mind, um, let me take you through an implant uh, case. So this is how I kind of go through looking for a single tooth image. I'm looking for an MB2, I'm looking for a fracture. If you don't mind, let's move on to an implant case. So if I scroll here, I've got my scans here, my digital uh, impression scans. And let's look at the scan right here. So this is a 10 by 10 image, so 10 centimeters uh, in diameter, 10 centimeters high. Uh, so I'm getting plenty into the sinus here at 10 high and 10 deep, getting way back into the spine. In fact, this is a fantastic one. Many might say, well, I need a larger, deeper image so that I can capture the airway. Um, that's not necessarily true. So this image here is 10 centimeters deep, and you can see the spine starting right here. You'll notice they started the image way forward of where they needed to. So the operator who took this image, took the image over here, and we have all of this wasted data, in my opinion, that is unnecessary. Had they positioned the patient in the machine where, um, uh, where it's supposed to be targeted, the image would have started here and gone back into the spine. So obviously 10 centimeters deep is more than enough to capture the airway. Um, and do some assessment of the airway. And then 10 high, you can see here, uh, gets us plenty high as well. So this is a 10 by 10. What you're seeing on your screen now, let's turn off some of these things I turned on earlier. My plain views over here were showing up on my rendering. But as you can see here, we have some digital impression scans. So the patient has a lower digital impression scan overlaid over the top of the cone beam, and then another uh, scan uh, from another manufacturer possibly laid over the top of the uppers. And then you'll see a tooth here. This is designed in some sort of uh, restoration creation software or it's a generic tooth, it doesn't matter. Um, so if I go ahead and minimize that, I wanna set this up now for you so that we can travel through looking at uh, placing an implant. So most softwares have the ability to place implants and plan for implants. So typically, if you look at your software in your implant section, you'll see your nice cross-sectional views that you've been wanting to look at. And then you'll see a nice panoramic here. 
And then this is your panoramic curve, which is also known as your axial view as well. So typically what I'll do is I'll have the image set up and I'm going to grab my little uh, slide bar here. I'm controlling these red lines here are those same red lines here. So as I travel down the focal trough, I'll actually show you, look in your upper left, I'm traveling around the focal trough. So if my implant is over here on this uh, first molar, it looks like, I've got my nice cross-sectional view here. I've got the, uh, the eye nerve canal uh, highlighted nicely here as well. So if you want to, to mark the nerve, go ahead and hit a draw nerve icon in our software, it's over here on this right toolbar. And then I can just simply left click and draw the nerve. And all I'm doing is left clicking and when I'm all done, I just double click. In fact, if I want to move it and follow it buckle or lingual, I could have drawn it in my cross-sectional view, but it was quicker for me to just to draw it here. And then I just grabbed it and centered it. If you really want to be accurate, you can just double click on it and we can take up the size of it and actually fill the eye nerve canal nicely. So and change the color as well. So the nice thing about marking the nerve, not only is this good from a patient presentation standpoint, what's nice about marking the nerve is if your software has uh, artificial intelligence built into it to actually detect that nerve, that's where it can really help you. Because now that I've marked the nerve, and I want to get my measurements, which is right here, measure length, and I can drag down and get the measurement. So I've got 20, and then as far as width, this patient here, I've got 11 wide to work with. So now that I know that what my um, width and depth measurements are, if you hit your library, you can access all of your library images or uh, implant systems. Hey, so Brent, let's just, yep, go ahead. a question about um, how do you set the range of the image? Uh, if you could show us again, how do you set the range of the image? As far as how I had moved these cross-sectional views? I believe so. Okay. So I'm just taking my slide bar and sliding it over to where my implant's going to be. And now I have my cross-sectional views. If you notice, look at my mouse. If I'm off on this left one over here, it's hard to see on the screen probably, but you can notice in the upper right, take a look over there, watch the red lines. One of them on the left is white. If I continue to move down the path, it'll change colors. So as I hover over each of those cross-sectional views, this is representing those uh, lines as well. So let's go back now and um, so hit our she library. She just clarified, um, like to see the air weight or to narrow it down to a specific area. Yeah, we'll get to that. Yep, we'll, uh, we'll definitely get to airway. Um, um, but, uh, on the next scan, we will be doing a pseudo pan, pseudo ceph and airway. All right, so let me just go ahead and just grab whatever implant system you want. We have to have 80 manufacturers in here. Um, so you can just grab whatever implant system you prefer and we're going to just go ahead and grab one and if you want you can grab the surgery kit that's assigned to it as well and hit add to plan. So if I go ahead and left click I can set it down wherever I want. If I grab it I can move it. If I grab my points I can tilt it. Now I mentioned that we marked the nerve and we did it not only for patient presentation but we did it for another reason. This is gonna define our safety distance. So if, for example, I get that implant too close to the nerve, it's going to let me know that I've got an implant to nerve uh, uh, issue. And it'll also show me in my bottom right-hand corner in red that I've got a safety violation. You'll also notice if I maximize it for you, you've got a red box around the implant and it's highlighting it in red to also alert me as an operator of the software that I'm too close to the nerve. If I grab it and I move it out of the way and I do not leave the safety disk area, it's not gonna re-alert me, but it certainly stays red to catch my eye. But if I slide it up and out of the way back into my safe section, then I lose the red color and my red indicator is now gone. I'm now back into the safety zone. 
So now that I have the implant placed, I can hit my centric view. And centric view gives us a nice 360 degree view of that implant site. I can take a cruise around that implant site. I can verify that I didn't uh, perf anywhere. I can make adjustments from this spot as well. That's not a problem wherever I wanna make them. I can do it all in the centric view. In fact, some implantologists will start here. They'll place an implant. They won't even use these other views. They'll go right to centric view and it'll give them the view that they need all the way around the implant site and make their final um, adjustments there. And what's really nice is, is if you want to uh, basically secure an implant report for your uh, practice management software, you can hit this button over here and we can hit save. And if I hit save, I've now generated a PDF document that can be placed into any software of my choosing, my practice management software, for example. And um, I've got a full detailed report for that patient um, based upon the measurements and the implant system that we used, so on and so forth. So from a risk mitigation standpoint, um, this is nice to have because now I've defined exactly the sleeve that I chose, the implant system I chose, the part number, and the dimensions. So, all right, so let me kind of go ahead and move this out of the way, and then let's move on to the question of airway. All right, so I'm gonna go back to a fantastic image. This one's a nice image because it's gonna give us a lot of information. Any orthodontists that are on the line right now, this is probably what you've been waiting for is creating a pseudo pan from your 3D image, creating your Ceph from the 3D image. And if you wanna mark the airway, you can do that as well. And I'll show you those three things um, when the image is up here. So this particular image is what I would um, call a full large field of view uh, for the ortho world or OMS world, um, 17 high and 20 deep. So obviously getting the landmarks that we need like the cella point and the nasion. So if you are new to 3D, make sure you have a machine that's getting to the mid frontal bone, as you can see here on this patient. Uh, most of your machines out there, if they are uh, pushing the envelope with a 13 high centimeter, 15 high centimeter, 16 centimeter high image, you run the risk, obviously, of cutting off the nasion. Because if you know the average measurement of the nasion, it's 12.8 uh, millimeters. So 13 millimeters from uh, mandible to nasion. Your cone beams are coned down. That's the shape of the cone beam. So your measurement from the manufacturers from the center of the image only, not the outer edges. So your 17 high is here, we're dropping down to about 15 here. So if I've got a 13 high image, I'm gonna be down into 11 and cut off the nasion. That's why you'd have to have a 2D Ceph on your machine. If you wanna take a comb beam and extract a, a Ceph, you'd have to have a 2D Ceph. So this image here is a nice image, gives, gives us all the information we need. So let's look at a couple things. Let's first start with creating a panoramic. So if we had a reason to create and generate a panoramic, we can certainly do that. Let me reset everything. In fact, if I hit reset view at the top, I can reset this image the way it came from the machine from the get-go. So if we're gonna draw a panoramic curve, you basically have three or four choices. A, trust the software. The software algorithms attempt to find the best focal trough they can. Are they perfect? No, pretty close. But if you want to override what the software originally intended to do, you can certainly hit this button over here called Panoramic Auto Fit, and we can generate an automatic fit of that focal trough. If you prefer to make adjustments, you can hit the hand here, and we can certainly grab any of these points and move them around and modify this as needed to draw the panoramic curve as we see fit. Or if you like to maintain control of your panoramic curve, which is certainly an option, we watch board certified radiologists, they like to draw their own curves. So they'll typically um, look at the condyles up there. Let's get the arch here and they'll start here and they'll just follow the panoramic 
curve of the patient and just draw their own. So all I'm doing is just left clicking. And when I'm all done, just double click and set my points. And then once again, if I wanna make adjustments, because those lowers are not in the focal trough, I can make that set up just nicely. All right, so we've created our uh, generated a pseudo pan, but we're not done yet because we want to make this thing look even better than that. Because maybe we are going to send this back to the referring GP and we want to share with them a beautiful panoramic taken from our beautiful 3D machine. So if you look at this button here, we can take 3D render mode, we can click on that, and I'm going to tell you a little tip and trick hit MIP black and white. Once you've done that, Go ahead and take this slide bar here. And that slide bar, if I hover over it because of our lag here, let's just see here, adjust 3D rendering transparency. I've just changed the transparency of that image. And if you want, we can turn off the crosshairs and we can take a picture. And I've got to say that's probably the best pan I've ever seen. And that was generated from a 3D machine. Less radiation than taking a 2D pan in the first place which is really nice. So now we've got a beautiful panoramic um, image. We can go back to 3D. And if we just give it a second here, we can generate our Ceph by hitting the button at the top, which is our virtual Ceph. Once again, taking a 3D image at, uh, at dose levels uh, less than a panoramic, I've got my pan from that image. I got my 3D image from that uh, that 3D volume, and I certainly have my Ceph from that. And if I like rulers, I can do that. If I want to calibrate it against a Ceph software, I can do that as well. So I know we're going through a lot of this fast. Just so you know, there's plenty of resources out there, plenty of videos available, plenty of training opportunities uh, to have trainers uh, remote in and help you with training on, on 3D software. That's not a problem. Purpose of this was just to get you through software so you're comfortable with some of the main things that are used in 3D software. Um, certainly not to, to go in here and, and show you every little bell and whistle, um, but I just created that nice Ceph there. I've cranked up my sharpen factor, which I really like, and um, that's, that's a pretty nice um, Ceph that we just generated. In fact, some will hit this button here. This is Clarify. And, uh, really makes a nice image. And then once again, I can right click copy, right click paste if I'm using a 3D, uh, or I'm sorry, an ortho software. I can copy that and then get that into my ortho software as well. Um, if you don't have 3D, um, or I'm sorry, ortho software, that's not a problem. In Romexis, um, this software here that we're using, you can either do your own Ceph tracing by hitting Ceph module, or you can hit this button here and it'll automatically with an artificial intelligence create a Ceph tracing within seconds. And if you want to modify it, you have the luxury of doing that. And that's just a subscription. You just hit this button and um, it automatically generates um, your Ceph. Hey, so Brent, hope, there were yeah. two, two questions kind of on the, um, this topic um, about radiation specifically. Um, sure. How much is is taking? Uh, how much radiation is uh, the patient receiving when taking a scan uh, that you're showing here? Um, and then the, somebody asked to confirm that this field of view is less than a regular pan in dosage. Okay, so we'll probably want to save a lot of these details for other courses. We're going to be going over radiation information in our upcoming webinar, so please stay tuned for more details. So I'm going to give you a fast answer if you can listen fast. So I would say um, good benchmark, think of the number 20, all right? So 20 is typically what a panoramic uh, a microsievert of radiation is to a patient. Uh, what's a microsievert? Doesn't matter. You get 10 microsieverts a day, eight to 10 microsieverts. So a day's worth of radiation to you or to your patient, think of the number 10. A panoramic is 20. So it's two days worth of radiation. The image I'm showing you here, we are taking this um, at 20 high, 17, or I'm sorry, 17 high, 20 deep. We're taking that at low dose. We are taking that at um, 18 microsieverts. 
If we take it at normal resolution, which is the real world possibly for another machine, we're taking that at probably 30 microsieverts. All of our data is available on, our, on the website and uh, very transparent. We disclose all of our radiation values. So if you have a 3D machine of ours, obviously your plan mecca rep can provide that data to you. You can go to our website. Um, a go-to image, Jody, um, let's say you're doing a 10 by, well, let's say 10 by 10 or an uh, 11 deep airway, eight high. You're probably, oh, let's see here. You're asking me without grabbing my numbers um, off the top of my head, probably 35 microsieverts at normal resolution. I can take an image of everyone's teeth in their mouth at low resolution um, for about 12 microsieverts. We can take 3D PAs at three microsieverts. A PA in the mouth is 10 microsieverts, unless you have a long cone short a rectangle collimator, um, you're, which most offices don't, they're, they're firing about 10 microsieverts. So a 3D PA taken at about three microsieverts. Now, I'm not telling you what other machines have. I don't represent them. So I certainly don't know what their radiation levels are. I would certainly want to figure that out and make sure um, I'm informed and get those data um, sets sent from the manufacturer. So um, you understand what those radiation levels are, but I'm just giving you um, my experience for um, the particular, our particular product line, if you don't mind. So hopefully that answered that question. And then the last one that we had on the list before we wrap up um, is going to be airway. So you can see here the patient's airway. Um, on the airway, we can certainly just hit this little button here and it just tells us what to do. It says click points and we just click all the way through and we can say done and it'll generate um, an airway analysis and it'll take us to the most restricted spot on that patient and then we can also just drag it down and move around we'll get our volumetric airway measurements as well so airway analysis is super easy it's just a click of the button hit this and draw your points if you need more uh, information on that you can certainly look at the videos on youtube or vimeo um, and they will show you how easy it is to just uh, mark the airway. So, all right, so we're getting near the top of the hour. I know that there were plenty of other things we wanted to get to. Um, I can certainly finish by wrapping everything up in a little bow and going through one more scan that kind of highlights all of the features and things that I would recommend that you do when you look at an image. So Jody, do we have a little time to, to yep, do that? Okay, so I'm going to show you a case. I love this case. This is a great case because it's got a lot of pathology, and I'm going to walk you through what I would do if I had 3D software sitting in front of me today, and I'm looking at this image for the first time. What I want you to do is I want you to obviously change your slice thickness to the thinnest slice. I would tell you to control your contrast and brightness however you like, and then I'm going to make sure that those are off and then I'm gonna adjust my rendering. So I'm gonna clean up that rendering so I can get rid of my scatter radiation. Now, I'm looking at this patient and right now I can already tell that they've got something going on here. What I want you to do is when you look at that image, do not look at your region of interest first. I want you to go through the scan as if you never knew anything about the patient and just try to find things, okay? So I'm not gonna teach you the systematic approach that a board certified radiologist would do. You can go to courses, let's say at Plan Mecca, um, and you can be taught by a board certified radiologist to go through how they look at a scan, but I'll give you a couple of tips and tricks if you don't mind. I'm going to split the screen up into fourths, and I'm gonna call this area one, and this is area two, because that's where I really want you to focus. So I'm gonna go through this patient. I'm gonna start at the bottom, and as I go up through the patient, I can see the mental frame in here. As I continue to go up, I can see gutta percha right there. So that patient had endo. And as I continue to look, I'm gonna just keep an eye on these teeth here and see if I notice anything as I continue to explore right there. So now I see that this is bifurcated. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but what's nice is that I can at least make a circle and I can make an annotation there. 
So if I ever do endo on that tooth, I can decide whether I need to refer that out or keep it in house. At least I know. So I'm going to continue up, continue up, and let's see if there's anything else that we see. Oh, as I look through here, everything looks pretty good. All right. So now I'm going to head down. So we're going to look in area two I told you to look. So let's look at this region here. Let's magnify it so you can see a little bit better. Well, for starters, there's that hole we saw. <laughs> All right. So there is something of concern. Once again, I don't have to know what it is. I just want to make an annotation in case I get inter interrupted and need to go back and see another patient. So I just made a little circle there. And as I continue on and cruise through the scan, there's my gutta percha. I'm going to continue on, continue on, keep going down. I'm into the crowns of the lowers. And let's just, take, oh, there's another bifurcated canal. All right. And now I'm going to continue to cruise down, cruise down, and see if there's anything else that I need to see. Oh, it looks like we have. All right. All right. So let's just go back up, see if we missed anything. I'm going to check out this region here. Keep going back up, going back up. And basically, I just went through, well, I just caught something right there. All right. So let's mark that. All right. So I just have found four things on this particular patient. So now that I've done that, I don't have to know what they are, but I can mark them quickly. I can have a conversation with my patient. I can see that the sinuses are completely full there. So I can quickly do a little mini radiology report, put that in the patient's file. And then as I go through the scan with the patient, I have everything bookmarked. So I can just go through these things and say, patient, bifurcated there, not a big deal. If we ever need endo in the future, at least I know when I get in that tooth, what it's gonna look like. I'm gonna click here. Ah. That's something that we need to address. And this one here that we found, where is it? Where is it? Ah, that one there. That's probably one we need to address. So you don't have to do all this in front of the patient, but I wanna show you how easy it was because now I can cruise over here. I can right click and I can see the sizable abscess. I can see the rendering here. There's a hole here. That, uh, that plate is, is, is gone. So maybe Mr. Patient or Miss Patient, we need to address that today right? No one wants to see that going on. So now that I have this information, the patient's on alert, maybe we can have a conversation. This happens to be bridge supported, and we may have to address that. Let's go and look at that other one. There was another one that we saw here, bifurcated, not important, bifurcated, not important, that one right there. All right, so now we're going to cruise over there. I'm going to right-click, rotate. I'm going to right-click and set that up. And let's take a peek at that. So maybe we need to explore that a little bit further because we see at the root tip there something going on. So that's going to require a little bit more investigation, a little bit more time. Maybe I do that after the patient leaves. I tell them that we're going to take a peek at it and get back to them. But those are some of the things that a board certified radiologist would help you with um, to get through a scan. So I know we just ran over by three minutes. I think we started a little late, but I think we came in right at the hour mark, Jody. Um, Want to just open it up for questions before we hand out the CEs for everybody? Sorry, I was muted. While he's answering some questions, I will go ahead and post the CE survey link in the chat along with the AGD code. Please note that we will send an email communication tomorrow with the CE survey link and a link to the recording of today's webinar. I know we've had several questions. Um, additionally, uh, we had several people asking about um, the features and functionality of Remexis 6. Um, Brent, I don't know if, you, while I post this, if you want to give them just a kind of high-level update on timing and um, what, the expect, what they should expect from a features and functionality difference. That would be great. Okay. So, um, and then I can kind of, I pulled up the Q&A as well here to, 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 to go through as well. Uh, it looks like there's some good questions. So yeah, Romex is six. We're just around the corner. Stay tuned. If you're uh, tuned into Facebook, you can always go to um, Plameca USA's website and um, see some announcements coming up on the launch of Romex is six. Um, I will tell you, if you are a Romex is user, this is certainly no facelift. Um, I should say certainly no facelift by itself, um, completely um, built from the ground up a, um, a whole new look and feel of the software, but a lot of great things that are going to be built in the software. So let's say I just went through this course with you today. 
this course will be available to you right inside of Romexis so that you can walk through scans together. So a lot of cool things are going to be available, um, surgery um, uh, modules available, um, I would say model analyzer on our CAD CAM side. So there's a lot of cool things, but just stay tuned to social media, stay tuned to planmecca.com's website in the next coming weeks, and we should have something for you very, very shortly. Um, Jody, if you don't mind, you want me to just kind of grab these questions from the Before bottom it. up? Yep. yep. Okay. So not airway, but this. Um, uh, analysis of bone volume for sinus augmentation. Protocol. Okay. Um, from David, when we say 3D PA, is he taking it with low dose on the smallest volume? What's unique is, is you can take ultra low dose on any size image, any volume size, any voxel size. That's what's really unique without sacrificing image quality. So when we're talking about taking a 3D PA um, and we're talking about taking that low dose, sure. Patient walks in today and we're taking an intraoral PA and it's 10 microsieverts. Why not take a 3D PA for three? And now we got a 360 degree view of that tooth. And now we know everything we need to know about the patient along with their clinical examination and health history. So we have all of that at a third of the radiation of an intraoral. Now, if we wanna maximize and take it up to normal resolution, sure, we can do that for about the same radiation level as that PA that was taken in the mouth one time. So hopefully that answers your question on the radiation levels and what we're talking about and what a 3D PA is. It's gonna be what we call a single tooth, but it's typically about two or three teeth. 360 degree view of that tooth, and we can take it at low res, high res, doesn't matter. We can do it all at ultra low dose. And if you want to know more about image selection, we're going to have a course on that. So stay tuned. Uh, stay, visit the website often because we're going to have a course on image selection to help you decide what image is best for you and your patients. Um, you're welcome on the answer. Can I follow, follow up? Can you snap a picture in 2D for insurance claim? Well, that's a fantastic question. I'm not gonna certainly get into insurance on that. You can certainly take a, 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 a picture of it and submit that to insurance if that's what they're asking for and that's up to them what they wanna see from you. So sure, if you need a picture, you can take a snapshot, send that in if that's what they're asking you to do and that uh, can be done easily with the software. Um, extract the end of view from the CT scanner. Should we take a teeth view? Um, can we extract from all of the teeth and go down to a single tooth? Absolutely. You can go to your region of interest, um, which you see over here, and we can crop that down to that particular size. Um, and we can make that image as small as we want or take it up to the full size as well. Um, I'll tell you, you can also, what's really cool is a um, little hidden secret. We can take a scan at, let's say, low resolution and we can reprocess it through our computer algorithms and actually take and produce a higher res scan out of that. Um, and that's done inside the actual software. So we can take low dose scans, get low um, radiation levels to the patient, and then we can reprocess that image and provide a higher resolution scan through Romexis. Um, so that's, that's a fantastic uh, question. Um, extract airway, we already covered Jody. Um, are their CBCT bite wings adequate for recare visits? Bite wings are not taken. Uh, well, I should say combing is not utilized for, for caries detection. Uh, we're looking at pathology, uh, looking at gross anatomy. So when we're looking at bite wings, um, we're looking for caries. Um, absolutely, you'd want to take um, an extra oral bite wing um, from your panoramic, or if you needed to take an intraoral for some reason, you could do that as well. Um, but caries detection, comb beam, all the studies have proven that it's better. The problem is, is there's metal in the way. So once we have scatter radiation going on, we can't see that, that cavity. So that's why at the crown level, comb beam is generally not the reason why you'd be taking it. You'd be taking an intraoral or a 2D panoramic to, to see at the crown level. Uh, comb beam's generally at the bone level down, but that doesn't mean we can't see it at the crown level just depends on what's in the way. So hopefully that answers that question. Can you adjust the field of view 
after taking the image? Yes, we can do that. Um, we've covered that one. Uh, no, I know the button. Can you extract the airway to get rid of all the hard tissue? Oh yeah, yep. So um, if you're still on the line, um, let me attempt to go back to that volume if you don't mind. Um, this is probably sitting over the top. He should be on, he just posted it. Okay, wonderful. All right, so if I go back to the scan here and I extracted the airway, I think what i um, trying to find out is can we look at just the extracted airway? So let's just give that a second. Um, you're gonna put me on the spot here. Let's see if I can quickly do it, there you go. All right, so now I've got the extracted airway. What's really cool is, is not only do I have the volumetric um, uh, image here, we have a module called superimposition. And I can actually look at a, uh, a pre-scan and a post-scan. Um, so let's say I did a scan appliance, um, or I'm sorry, uh, an appliance, a sleep appliance for the patient. And I wanted to show those two airways side by side on the screen to show them how we translated the jaw forward and open up the airway. Superimposition allows us to do that inside the software. So I can look at both volumetric measurements side by side. I can look at a cone beam side by side. I can look at whatever information I want side by side. So hopefully that one was taken care of. Uh, just to be clear, when we're looking for a fracture, would you use high res? That's the only time I would use it. So if I'm looking for a fracture, I'd wanna use my highest resolution. I want that tube head and sensor to maximize. I wanna drive that car as fast as it can. So I want to slam on the gas and put it in seventh gear. If you wanna think of it that way. So I wanna maximize the sensor and the tube head. When I wanna do that is for a fracture. Everything else can be seen at 200 microns. I can see MB2s, I can see abscesses across the room, I can see anything I need to see. In fact, if I take it at low resolution, let's say we did it at 400 microns or 600 microns, I can see those exact same things for the most part. So resolution sometimes gets confusing because there's so many different products on the market. So when I talk about seeing stuff at 200 microns, maybe others can't. So there might be a concern about that, but I'm telling you right now, the only time I'm hitting endo mode is if I'm looking for a fracture, certainly not for an MB2, certainly not for anything else. Yeah. All right, I think we've got time for one more question. So go awesome. ahead and field one from the, the list. And we'll oh, you're gonna put me on the spot of who I get yep. to pick. I'm gonna make two <laughs> people upset. Let's see who we're gonna make upset. Measure my process. No, we know there was no pain off the radiation. How do we know there's no pain off? Well, that's a fantastic question for a board certified radiologist. So uh, Dr. Peter Green um, does some fantastic courses. If you go to our website, he's generally doing a course a week with us and he certainly addresses that. But I would love for that question to come up to a board certified radiologist on how to address and that. And I actually did post um, the link to our um, okay. courses um, that are available for CBCT interpretation specifically right now for implant workflow and we are adding one for orthodontists this week as well. Um, so be on the lookout. And that is actually on planmecha.com slash training uh, as those are paid courses. So um, there's a quick question about the recording. So it will be posted tomorrow on the same place where you registered, but it will also be included in your follow-up email. So, all right, thank you, Brent. Appreciate your time. Uh, thanks for all the questions that came in. Um, again, we're gonna be continuing to do a lot of these um, programs and um, some will actually be pre-recorded on very specific topics. Um, as we get a lot of questions, it will help us narrow down the topics that we're offering. So thank you all for joining and um, have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you.